What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah, and if you couldn't tell by the beautiful decor in the background, this is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. And as always, I'm joined by my man Mike, at Mike Me Up on Twitter. Mike, there's been a lull in content recently. Not content, but NFL festivities. The Combine is behind us, but we have free agency on the way. So how are you feeling about that? I'm feeling fantastic, man. I just got back from your hometown, San Diego. My girlfriend took me out there. I went for one of her friend's weddings. Ate everything that i saw um basically gained like 10 pounds so i go back on a diet but it's fucking awesome dude you got hella good tacos over there uh, excited to bring you i think this is gonna be one of the best episodes that we put out to be honest we have a ton of information you know draft combine hype is behind us so it's, now it's time to get into the nitty-gritty of free agency baby yeah mike's talking about getting fat we're gonna be talking about fat running backs it's just it's all coming <laughs> full circle no pun intended but we're gonna be looking at some guys who are going to make a big impact this offseason, whether or not they sign with their previous team or they go elsewhere. Some big names are like Melvin Gordon, Austin Hooper, Hunter Henry. Basically, everybody on the Chargers that you thought was worth a damn is now going to leave, so you might <laughs> know how I feel about that. But also, just looking at last year, you may not think free agency has a huge impact, but we saw guys like Le'Veon Bell switch teams after he dropped his mixtape. James Conner's stonks went through the roof. And even some <laughs> lesser-known guys like Roger Saffold, he basically did a little Thano snap Los Angeles Rams offensive line disintegrated, and then the Titans, in turn, had a really good offensive line. Other guys like Trent Brown moved teams, Mark Ingram. So it really has a bigger impact than you may think in getting out ahead of it and getting the information supporting what's going to happen because of free agency moves is going to be a huge win for you, not only in Dynasty Leagues, buying players before they sign on new teams, but also for redraft. If you're you know here for redraft purposes, even though it's a Dynasty show, there's going to be value for you for this season. I know Fade the Public this week is also going to go through it. So we have a lot of content for you guys this week. Hopefully we don't get some Adam Schefter tweets during the show on these guys re-signing with their own teams. We can throw all this analysis. But, you know, without further ado, we're going to kick this off with – you'll find out after the intro. All right, first up, we got my man, Melvin Gordon, switched up on me. I bought his jersey, number 28, switched to 25. That thing is about to go in the garbage. But for fantasy purposes, where we think he might land next year, looking at cap space, I think Miami could definitely be a landing spot for him. Would it make sense? Hell no. But Miami isn't in the business of making sense. They traded for Aqib Tlaib, whose you know, ACL was straight off the bone last year. I mean, they have a ton of cap space. They don't have a running back, despite all the DFS people saying. Patrick Laird is like an actual running back. Uh, <laughs> they're a rebuilding team. I don't see a reason for them to bring in a 27-year-old running back heading into the season. So although it's reasonable cap-wise, I don't think that's realistic, you know, if Miami actually does want to rebuild. Another team in Florida, I think Tampa Bay also could be in the running. In the top five in cap space, their highest paid running back right now is only Ronald Jones at $1.9 million. Uh, Peyton Barber's a free agent, and we know Bruce Arians wants to use running backs out of the backfield. He really hasn't had that opportunity yet in Tampa Bay because they had Ronald Jones, Peyton Barber, and Albert Okwebunam's cousin, Dar Gumbawale or whatever. <laughs> so there really wasn't somebody who could give him a, a dual threat skill set out of the backfield like he had with David Johnson or Andre Ellington. So uh, I think that would be a good fit not only for fantasy purposes, but also real life in Bruce Arians' scheme. That would obviously take away a little bit of the passing volume for the pass catchers in Tampa Bay, but this is all hypothetical, so I'm not going to dive too deep into there. But what we will dive into is, and first I'll say this is soliloquy season. We're going to be going in-depth on these guys. I might put up a timer to see how long I talk, but his vacated <laughs> opportunities this year. He only played in 12 games, so 25% of the season was lost, but he saw over 204 touches and even more opportunities because he saw 52 targets, 42 receptions, and as for you know, a huge part of his usage and a huge, huge part of his fantasy production was red zone usage, right? He had 30 red zone carries, which was 52% of the team's red zone carries. He also had 13 carries inside the five, which was top 10 in the NFL, which is extremely surprising uh, considering the offense wasn't all too good this year and he did miss a big chunk of the season. Now, obviously you're wondering how that impacts Austin Eckler. Over the first four weeks of the season, Austin Eckler saw nine red zone carries. On the season as a whole, he only saw 16. So over half of his carries inside the 20 came in only 25% of the season. On top of that, he saw five goal line carries, which are inside the five carries. On the season, season as a whole, he only saw seven. So an even greater proportion of his carries inside the five came in a very small sliver of the season. 
But the fact that he saw that many without Melvin Gordon leads me to believe that if they don't add a Jordan Howard through free agency, uh, Derek Henry, they don't draft an A.J. Dillon, one of these big fat running backs, uh, don't type in the comments that they're actually not fat. I understand that they're professional athletes. But <laughs> if they don't bring in one of these big body running backs or somebody who has proven to be a goal line talent, I don't see how Austin Eckler doesn't claim that job. I mean, Justin Jackson did see some goal line touches uh, in 2018, right? But he's not their main goal line guy. They showed it was Austin Eckler. They showed it this year. They showed it in years past. So that's a huge uptick in his production if he does get those goal line touches. The offense may regress a bit, so maybe the goal line opportunities won't be as high. But the, the fact that he's going to be getting these opportunities when they're there for him is going to produce fantasy value. Now, as for his receiving usage, you may think if he's the main guy back there, his targets are going to go through the roof. That actually is not true. If you look at his red zone targets last year in the games where Melvin Gordon was not there, it was at 0.75 a game. When Melvin Gordon was there, it actually went up to 0.83 a game. And as for overall targets, it went from 6.3 in weeks one through four to 6.9, very nice, when Melvin Gordon was there. You may be thinking, oh, okay, why isn't he you know, getting more targets when Melvin Gordon isn't there? To me, it's personally just like how I see it is they want to get him the ball more, and he's obviously not getting a ton of carries when Melvin Gordon is there, so they supplant that with you know, passing down work. So overall for Austin Eckler, is he somebody I'm worried about? No. Is he somebody who I think is like a top three, top five running back? No. I think he's just a very solid running back, one who even if in a timeshare next year is going to be extremely efficient, and if he is the main guy, I don't expect anything more than like 70% of the work in that backfield. I mean, we've seen Justin Jackson get some decent touches this year um, or last year when Melvin Gordon was out. He's extremely efficient on those touches. So overall, Austin Eckler isn't a guy I'm running out to buy, especially at his price right now, especially after he just got signed to a four-year extension. People are going to be thinking he is a locked and loaded, you know, top 10 guy for the next three, four years. Although I don't disagree that that could be his ceiling. I, I wouldn't pay for somebody's ceiling in March when there's still so much to go around. So, Mike, how do you feel about Austin Eckler if Melvin Gordon does land? What are you willing to pay for him? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much in the same boat as you. Um, I put out a tweet earlier right when he got the extension saying, like, look, this is not the time to buy if you wanted to buy Austin Eckler. And I've been saying to buy him all the way up until now. So, like, I, I think they're, they are going to bring in someone. I don't think it's Justin Jackson because – did you know that Justin Jackson actually weighs less than Austin Eckler? So Eckler has yeah. a better BMI than Justin Jackson. He's a weird running style for his size, too. He's like a one-cut guy, and he, like, invites contact sometimes. I actually kind of I, – I really like Justin Jackson. but Yeah. So, yeah, well. I do, too. But, like, I think it's more likely than not they'll bring in, like, a thumper. And I think that's when you can buy. Because at the end of the day, like, I never expected Eckler to be a 75%, 70% workhorse role. I always thought he would be, like, a 60-40 guy, but he would get, like, most of the targets and all the most valuable touches. And yeah, with Melvin yeah. Gordon don, gone, like he might get some uh, goal line work as well. So, you know, I'm still looking to buy him at that like 1.08 rich range, which I don't think you can get him for anymore. So I'm going to wait till the price falls a little more. Yeah, that makes sense. And on top of that, right, in the first four weeks when he was the main guy, he was playing 71% of the snaps. But every single week, other than the Miami game where Justin Jackson, I think he had a calf injury. Prior to that, his snaps went from like 23 to 25 to 30 something percent. So we could see, you know, him getting a little bit more involved and Austin Eckler's workload getting pushed back, not all too much. It wasn't anything drastic, but him, you know, losing a little bit of his snap share. So he's not a workhorse as we just touched on. Somebody who also, enjoyed- also Eckler, like the reason why I don't think Eckler will be a workhorse is like in those like four weeks, basically after week one or week two, he was showing up on the injury report like every week. Yeah. So he's just he's not really a concussions too. And yeah. Anthony Lynn in 2018, after he suffered a neck injury, not Anthony Lynn, but Austin Eckler suffered a neck injury. He said something about like, oh, I view him as like a special teams player. Like, come yeah. on, <laughs> this dude's a beast. He just put a picture of him like shirtless and he's fucking yeah. massive. But yeah. somebody no who's a workhorse, though. somebody who I am buying, we told you to buy earlier this offseason, is another person who's impacted. It's Keenan Allen. And when I looked at his splits with and without Melvin Gordon, I was shocked. Like, Obviously, this doesn't mean – I'm going to put them on the screen. This doesn't mean that he's going to go out there and put up 1,900 yards next year if, if Melvin Gordon's gone because a lot of Melvin Gordon's touches are going to be taken over by a new running back. But to look at how much more he was involved, not only this year, but since 2017 when Keenan Allen returned from injury, it, it's mind-blowing. I'll just read off the numbers in case you're listening on podcast. This past year, in games without uh, Melvin Gordon on the field, he was averaging 8.5 receptions on 12 – well, he had 12 targets for 8.5 receptions, 113 yards, and .75 touchdowns a game. Full season pace, 192 targets, 136 receptions, over 1,800 yards, 12 touchdowns. With Melvin Gordon on the field, 
those numbers dipped to, for a full season pace, 136 receptions, or 136 targets for 93 receptions, 996 yards, and four touchdowns. That is a massive drop-off. And as for the three-year sample, the numbers were basically the same. His points per game were seven higher, or like six and a half higher, uh, in half PPR when Melvin Gordon was not on the field. His touchdowns for a season-long pace went up by six. His receptions went up by, quick mental math, 35. Don't, don't check me on that. And his yards went up by uh, 499. So basically when Melvin Gordon wasn't on the field, he, uh, Keenan Allen was used extremely heavily. Uh, people that are selling him because he's getting older and because there's a new quarterback there, you have to realize the role that he has in this offense is that big slot, right? He's not like a big thick slot. He's just a taller guy who wins, not with athleticism, but with nuance in his routes. Like obviously route running is subjective, but this guy can make Tanya Harding look like a fucking <laughs> amateur the way he puts people on skates. Uh, yeah, he's basically just an elite route runner. He, whatever quarterback is there, whether it's Justin Herbert, whether it's Tyrod Taylor, he's going to be an easy target for them to hit. So I don't see him, you know, falling off as far as people think. He's like 27 or 28 years old, which is not only a wide receiver's prime, but we've seen so many slot receivers produce into their early 30s, whether it's Julian Edelman or Larry Fitzgerald as he moved into that role. Uh, even a Doug Baldwin, who is littered with injuries, played until, you know, he's 29 or 30 years old, and he was an extremely solid fantasy contributor. So he's not somebody I'm selling. He's somebody who could see a slight uptick with Melvin Gordon gone. He is still heavily used in the red zone for this team. He is a target hog, and I could see him, you know, if you, if you could buy him for a late first, I'm 100% fine with that because the chances of that late first producing in year one and having the same value as Keenan Allen a year from now, in my opinion, is extremely low. Like, if you think about it, Nikhil Harry's value right now in comparison to Keenan Allen isn't close, and you could be in a very similar situation if you if you were to rather take that 108 draft a C.D. Lamb, not that I'm wishing bad upon C.D. Lamb, but the chances that he's going to be higher valued than Keenan Allen I don't know. I, I would rather just bet on Keenan Allen, maybe sell him next year if you start to see a bit of a decline. I don't know how you feel about that. I, dude, I love Keenan Allen. I mean, Keenan Allen has been a wide receiver one for the past three years consecutively. Like, not many wide receivers can say that. And he was the wide receiver one overall just three years ago. Um, and, dude, like, the splits with Melvin Corden, like, I saw that early on in the year, too, and it just, like, blew my mind. But it makes sense because of, like, the area of the field he works in. You and know, you always hear people... like that thing like, oh, Keenan Allen blows up in the second half of the year. People don't – they forget to remember that, you know, Keenan Allen is blowing up because Melvin Gordon's hurt every second yeah. half of the year. Yeah, exactly. So, look, I love Keenan Allen. I think if you're a contending team, you should be trying to get Keenan Allen on every single one of your teams because he's literally just entering the absolute peak for wide receivers. Like the 28 to 31 years, that's like the peak production for wide receivers. That's when they've like had all the experience. They're the top dogs in their offenses, and they're just like balling out of control. So. I'm buying uh, all day, every day. Yeah, and the thing about Keenan Allen, too, is like people are worried about his quarterback situation. Those same people are telling you to go out and buy Chris Godwin, go out and buy A.J. Brown, who are similarly in quarterback limbo, playing a similar role. Like, if you think Chris Godwin is locked in top three dynasty receiver, then you shouldn't be losing any, any hope or whatever on Keenan Allen. Sure, he's older, but they occupy a similar role in a similar situation quarterback-wise. So, yeah, to, to be worried that, you know, Justin Herbert's going to tank his value – I mean, he's he's one of the easiest targets to hit on the field. Even Phillip Rivers could hit him. So that, that tells you enough about how good of a player he is. As for Hunter Henry, as for Mike Williams, I looked into it. Hunter Henry's only played one game in his career with Melvin Gordon off the field. So it's it's hard to tell how his impact is going to be felt when Melvin Gordon is gone. As for Mike Williams, his splits are basically identical. He had that one huge game against Kansas City in 2018 where he had three touchdowns and a ton of yards and like a rushing touchdown. So, I mean, we don't like to throw out games. But if there was ever an outlier, it's probably that one. And then as a whole, in this offense, you may think they skew more pass-heavy when Melvin Gordon is gone. It's practically the same. They actually passed less often when Melvin Gordon was gone. Uh, 62% pass rate weeks one through four last year, as opposed to 64% the rest of the season. And that was the same case in 2018 when he was gone. On top of that, their offensive volume actually increased a little bit when Melvin Gordon was off the field, which, you know, it wasn't anything drastic. It was 69.75 plays a game without him as opposed to 66.75 with him, and points per game went up by 1.9. So Melvin Gordon basically proves to us that running backs don't matter other than for running backs that are going to replace them. And I guess Keenan Allen, you could say so. Overall, this offense, I don't expect to change all too much. I would think uh, Phillip Rivers leaving has more of an impact on this offense than Melvin Gordon does. If there's somebody I'm running out to buy out of value right now, it's probably Keenan Allen. And as you said, for Austin Eckler, if you want to go out and buy him, Give it a little bit of time. Give it a rest because people right now are on the hype train because he got paid like $6 million a year, which isn't – it's like two-thirds of what Jarek McKinnon got. 
And that guy's been in the hospital for the past two seasons. Yeah. Awesome. That wraps it up for him. Next up, we got my guy, Champagne Poppy, Kenyon Drake. You know how much I love this dude. Um, he is a, you know, he came over from the Miami Dolphins, was finally freed from that terrible freaking organization, and he unleashed himself onto the league, was by all definitions a league winner. Um, and he is now an unrestricted free agent. And, you know, recent news popped out that he's seeking – eight to 10 million, which is, you know, that workhorse RB1 money. So given that price tag, I'm not so sure the Cardinals will be able to afford keeping him, especially after they signed David Johnson onto that Abeltross contract last year. Like seriously, like somebody still, I'm still waiting for someone to point me in the direction of a running back contract that's worked out so far. It doesn't exist, but they only have 40 million. The Cardinals actually have the 20th uh, most cap space, so they're very low at only 39.7 million. So if they were to sink that much into him on top of, you know, wanting to rebuild around Kyler Murray, it just doesn't look like it could happen. It doesn't seem realistic based on how this team is building. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense, right? You're not going to spend $20 million on the running back when your team is nowhere close to contending. So they've done uh, it once before. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, for for me, I think the a good landing spot or the ideal landing spot for him would be the Texans. And that's also, also a likely landing spot because if we look at the Texans, and we'll get into this later, but they don't have many picks because they got Billy Bob OB over there as a GM and knows, doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. So they have very little, very little draft stock. They'll, all they have is a second round pick. They're not going to use that on a running back, I don't think. And we all know that they are one of the most running back needy teams. Um, and they do have some cap space on the team, right? So if we look at the Texans, uh, sorry, where are they? Oh, yeah, they're, they're, top, they're top 10 in cap space. They have about $60 million. So they can actually be one of the places that is able to afford a running back. Drake kind of walks in. He offers that workhorse role. Um, how many touches do you think Drake got in the eight games that he played for Arizona without looking? Eight times, let's say 17 a game. 136. Yeah, you're pretty close. Pretty close. He got about 158 touches. So 123 carries and 35 targets. So if you prorate that, you're looking at 300 plus touches over the course of a season. So that that's workhorse volume. Um, if he goes to the Texans, um, obviously that opens up some opportunity for David Johnson and more importantly, Chase Edmonds, because we all know David Johnson's washed as fuck. Um, and for the new team, I, I do think it's a ding on Duke Johnson. I don't think it'll make him completely irrelevant because, you know. I think he was already uh, kind of irrelevant. Like, how often yeah. are you really starting Duke Johnson? Yeah, not very often, right? And, and he did that with Carlos Hyde, who is not as good of a pass catcher as Kenyon Drake is. So if he goes there, I would expect Duke Johnson's stock to go down. And Kenyon Drake's stock to actually, you know, hopefully hold flat um, from where it is now. But, like. From, from like a bird's eye view, like to me, that's like the transaction that probably makes the most sense in terms of need, cap space, and, and draft stock. You know, we know that Hyde is gone. And like Bob just like, I don't know. I don't know what to think about Bob. You know, like you never know what he's going to do, especially now that he's, he's a GM. Like he's going to do something stupid and draft the running back in the second round. Like, Didn't they I have trade no idea. a third for Duke Johnson or like a fourth that turned into a third? Yeah, it was a conditional. It turned into a third. And I was just like, I was like, dude, like when they did that, I had so much hope that they would use Duke Johnson the way Duke Johnson. Duke Johnson was ranked as like a top 20 dynasty running back at that time. And then he just slowly started to fall off when they realized El Guapo was taking every single carry out of that backfield. Yeah, exactly. Um, in terms of what I'm going to do with them, I, I think I'm actually looking to buy. I know people are scared. And originally I thought Cardinals would be the best landing spot for him because of like he knows the system and it clearly works. And Cliff Kingsbury calls the right place for him. But I, after looking at more, I do think the Texans is a pretty good spot, right? I mean, they're going to have a pretty high-powered offense uh, led by Deshaun Watson. They have a mobile quarterback, so you kind of get that benefit from the Konami quarterback as a running back. And they're definitely in the contention, right? Like, you know, Tom Brady's kind of vacated the AFC, so, you know, they, they definitely have a shot to go for it. And if what they're missing is a running back to get there and they have the cap space to do it, I could totally see them doing it. Um, in terms of, like, cost, I'm, I'd be willing to invest, like, a top 10 rookie pick on the back half, uh, like that later third of the first round, if that's what it costs to get it done. And I'm a contender. I need a running back just because Drake does offer that workhorse role. Like, what do you think? What would you be willing to pay for him? Yeah, that might be a little bit pricey for me, but when you look at it, right, I think he's 26, but he doesn't have that wear and tear on his body. Even going back to college, Alabama, he wasn't used anything near a workhorse. He's obviously very good in like the limited sample he's been used. 
I know you brought it up earlier in one of the shows, but like over when he's had over 14 carries, he's basically like a top five running back. And you see it, right? This past year when he was brought in to the Arizona Cardinals, it was a short week. They played on Thursday and he teared up what was thought to be one of the best run defenses in the league in San Francisco. Like he just proves time and time again that he is a great receiver out of the backfield. He's a great runner out of the backfield. I think wherever he goes, because the Cardinals didn't have a great offensive line this year, their offense was up and down. Wherever he goes is going to be a decent landing spot so long as he has that workhorse role. If he gets paid that much, I don't see how he doesn't get put into a workhorse type of role. So, yeah, I think late first, early second is what I would be willing to pay for him. Obviously, you probably want to go out and do it now just in case he does get scooped up by the Texans and he does take over that starting role because Lamar Miller and Carlos Hyde are both unrestricted free agents this year. Um, even if, you know, he's brought in to a committee, we've seen him catch, you know, 50 plus balls. I'm not sure, so sure this year what he did, but I think in 2018, he caught like 56 and the year prior, he was up around 60. So he still caught 50, you, caught yeah, 50 he, and half of that time was spent in Miami. Yeah. He still gives you a ton of fantasy value, like basically James White type of value. And if you're paying late first and, you know, worst case scenario happens, he's a James White. I'm fine with, you know. You know, Mike, you swayed me. I would give up a late first for him because <laughs> the worst case scenario, he's still going to give you at least flex consideration. Whereas, yeah, exactly. like, yeah, one of those receivers you take at that spot in a rookie draft may not give that to you. Who would you rather have, Kenyon Drake or Todd Gurley? Kenyon Drake. I don't know. That offensive line, we're going to touch on it later, but they're losing even more pieces or may yeah. lose more pieces this offseason. And he just didn't look the same this past year. Yeah. All right. Next up. Amari Cooper, hometown favorite of Mike, a guy that Cooper. I hate. Basically, the wide receiver version of Derrick Henry for me. Places I think he could possibly land. There's one that is kind of common consensus people keep bringing up is the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, not only is Deshaun Jackson dead, Alshon Jeffrey is dead. Nelson Aguilar is a free agent. They don't have all too much money. It's in division, so I'm not so sure that, you know, Jer Jerry Jones is going to give him every single dime he can, you know, cough up to keep him out of uh, a rival team. I think another sneaky landing spot we just brought up are the Texans. They are eighth in cap space. Will Fuller's Achilles tendon is more tender than Kansas City barbecue. He is <laughs> never on the field. And if they were to be, like, be able to pair DeAndre Hopkins and Amari Cooper on that same team, I don't know if Deshaun Watson wouldn't be my dynasty quarterback at least two at that point because he would just have to close his eyes and throw it up and it's basically going for six every time. Obviously, DeAndre Hopkins uh, might take a bit of a hit but it's going to be consolidated target share if that were to happen. But that's enough with the hypotheticals. We'll just talk about what's going to happen in Dallas. And from what I found, it doesn't look great. Uh, vacated opportunities, 7.4 targets again this year, 8.4 the year prior. So around eight targets a game he's giving up when he leaves. Uh, only 17 of those came in the slot. So he is more of an outside receiver. So you would think Michael Gallup is going to capitalize on that on top of, you know, nine red zone targets left behind. Isn't all too much, but it's definitely something that other receivers can capitalize on. Also, 24 deep targets are left up for grabs. Michael Gallup was second on the team, so that's a role he can fill. But looking at what Michael Gallup did this past season, in games where Amari Cooper played less than 75% of the snaps, there's only four of them, it wasn't all that bad, right? 4.75 receptions a game, 75 uh, receiving yards a game. He actually didn't catch any touchdowns. Most Half of his touchdowns came in the last week. I believe it was against the Redskins, so it wasn't a huge touchdown threat. Basically, in the games where he played less than 75% of the snaps, his pace was 76 catches for 1,200 yards, practically what he put up this year. So you might think, oh, he can take over that alpha number one role if he's playing this well in games where Amari Cooper isn't playing. We look a little bit deeper. In games where Amari Cooper was shadowed, basically being treated as the alpha, and Michael Gallup was shadowed in some of these games, but you have to remember, you know, the number one corner is on Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper is not a slot receiver, meaning uh, those top cornerbacks don't shy away from him going into the slot. Like some, some cornerbacks don't travel into the slot. Mark Cooper's on the outside. Those top cornerbacks are on him. In games where Amari Cooper was shadowed, getting that number one treatment, Michael Gallup tore it up. He averaged over eight targets a game, over five receptions a game, over 87 yards a game for a 16-game pace of 138 targets, 85 receptions, and 1,397 yards. In games where Amari Cooper wasn't being treated as that pure alpha, whether it was because, I don't even know, they, they just weren't shadowing him. Uh, games where Michael Gallup was seeing a little bit tougher coverage, I guess you could say, when the number one guy wasn't focused solely on Amari Cooper. His numbers went down to 8.1 targets a game, 4.1 receptions a game, and 70.9 receiving yards a game for a pace of 130 targets, 66 receptions, and 1134 yards. So, as you might see, the volume isn't all too different, but the efficiency fell off drastically. 
People came at me on Twitter asking for context of these games, saying, oh, he was injured and it took him a while to come back. Although the game he came back from injury, he put up like 130 yards and a touchdown. And they wanted to throw out that Rams game as if you can just throw out games. So, hey, yo, when, when a player you like does bad, you just throw out the bad games. That's how, that's how the splits works, guys. The guy was like, oh, yeah, the whole team did bad. It's like, okay, sorry. You can't just say, Dude, if you took out everybody's bad game, everybody would be good at football. Kevin White would <laughs> yeah. still be catching passes if you took out every bad game he ever had. So to say that you can just throw out that one game against the Rams is blasphemy. Obviously, it does skew the numbers down a bit, but what can we expect when he is the number one guy? Sure, he looked really good this year, but how often was he really treated as that number one receiver in that passing game? For me, I'm a little bit worried about Michael Gallup looking a little bit more in depth in these stats. I'm not saying he's a wide receiver three. I'm not saying he's a terrible player to own. I just see him as more of a, you know, closer to a wide receiver 24 than like a top 15 guy, right? And if people are trying to buy him off of you and are giving mid first or late first for him, you know, late first, I'd probably just keep Gallup. Mid first, I'm definitely smashing that. Uh, I'm not so sure what you'd be willing to pay to either give him up or acquire him. If I were to acquire him, I definitely wouldn't go any higher than like, you know, a 110 to grab him because I just don't think that, you know, how this offense is going to be affected. We'll talk about Dak Prescott in a little bit, but how this offense is going to be impacted without Amari Cooper's presence there doesn't lead me to believe he's got the potential of, you know, a CD Lamb or uh, the other top guys that can be picked inside the top eight of rookie drafts. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I wouldn't pay more than the 1.110 for Gallup. And like my point is, you know, I don't think Gallup is bad, right? I think he's good. But I think that the the general consensus is that, hey, look, Amari Cooper's leaving. Gallup's going to have like 108 targets and be a wide receiver one. And I just don't think that's the case. Like some guys are just meant to be wide receiver twos. And that's that's totally fine, right? You we need saw those that guys this year with Tyler Boyd, right? We thought he was going to yeah. be awesome without uh, A.J. Green. Now he wasn't – he was the wide receiver one on that team. He wasn't a legit, you know, alpha wide receiver one that's going to see 200 targets and like 15 touchdowns and shit like that. But he was still productive. He just didn't do all too much better than what he did the year prior when A.J. Green was on the field. So if – if you expect his ceiling to be much higher than we'd, what he put up last year, I'd be hesitant. I think his ceiling is basically what he did last year. Um, and I think his floor is a little bit lower than what he did last year. So if you're paying for that premium, thinking he's going to make that third year jump after he already made that jump, yeah. uh, I would kind of push back and not, not make an offer if that's your current viewpoint on him. Yep, I totally agree. As for Dak Prescott, this team as a whole just completely flipped the script when Amari Cooper came there. I had the splits in 2018 for Dak Prescott when Amari Cooper joined the team as opposed to before he arrived. Not only did Dak Prescott average nearly five points per game more in half PPR, he was averaging over six more throws a game. Uh, you can see it on the screen, over seven more uh, completions a game, uh, less, less interceptions, more touchdowns, more yards per attempt, more passing yards by 72. Basically, this entire offense just started booming when he was there. And, you know, I'll coincide this with Ezekiel Elliott in 2018. Without uh, Amari Cooper there, he was averaging 16.5 fantasy points a game. With Amari Cooper there, 22.1. His receptions went from 3.57 a game to 6.5 a game. Uh, on the ground, it was, it was very similar. But he was being used so much more heavily in the passing game when Amari Cooper got there. They were, you know, moving down the field more. They were scoring more. This... I know I've said it about 15 times now, but this offense just got so much better when Amari Cooper was there. And if he leaves and they're left with Michael Gallup to be the wide receiver one on that offense, I'm not so sure we can just pencil in Dak Prescott for another top five year. I know he was, you know, top six quarterback before he got there, but this team has gone through so many changes. They have a different offensive coordinator that, you know, he built the offense with Amari Cooper in there. So, and they obviously tailed off down towards the second half of the year. So if he, if he lands on a different team, not only do I think Dak Prescott is hurt, I think, uh, Ezekiel Elliott isn't going to see the uptick in targets we may believe for those vacated opportunities because even this year in the games where Amari Cooper saw less than 75% of the snaps, uh, Ezekiel Elliott's 16 game pace on targets was only 60 and on the season he actually only finished with 54. So it's not like he saw an uptick in targets. The team as a whole, the volume goes down, the efficiency goes down. So I expect much of the same for Ezekiel Elliott as we saw this year. Uh, Dak Prescott, I see, you know, potentially big fall off and just as a whole, I just don't see many options on this team benefiting from a lack of Amari Cooper. Just because there's vacated targets doesn't mean everybody's just going to soak up every target that used to be there. The efficiency is going to go down, and all those targets might not come to fruition in 2020. Yeah, but what about what about big galaxy analytics brain Mike McCarthy? What about him? He's going he's gonna to have a dude, huge Mike McCarthy, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about the dude. I don't know anything about him other than he kind of looks like Jabba the Hutt, but maybe that's because he was in green for like 15 years, but... 
I, <laughs> this is an offense I'm probably just going to stay away from, especially at the prices they're going to be at next year. You know, Zeke is going to be a top two guy. I'm fine with that. But if, if Michael Gallup, especially in redraft, if he goes to like top 15 prices, I'd stay away. Dak Prescott in Dynasty, he's not somebody I'm like avidly trying to sell, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to buy him at this point because we've yeah. seen the difference between when he has an elite wide receiver on the field and when he doesn't. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I was a huge comp- proponent of buying Dak last year. I'm a little bit worried now. It's, it's kind of like so stupid that, that like Dallas literally went in the complete opposite direction of the guys you just locked down first. Like they first paid their running back and then they paid an off ball linebacker. And now they're going to have to let go of like a premier top five cornerback in the league, uh, a top 12 wide receiver, and they haven't even tagged their quarterback. Like, they haven't even locked down the quarterback. And they're, they're going to have to pay him more. They're going to have to pay him more because once the CBA comes out, like they're just going to pay more. So like it just doesn't make any sense how badly that organization is run. It always, it always blows my mind. Next up, we got someone who I've talked about a lot. We've talked about him in the prior episodes as well, but it's Brashad Perriman. And right now he's going off the board based on DLF ADP at wide receiver 60, which to me is still way too damn cheap because I cannot name 59 wide receivers that I would rather have. I can't even like fathom that number, like wide receiver 60. Who's like wide receiver 58? I have no idea. (laughs) It's like Nikeem (laughs) Hines. I just put him at a wide receiver just to put him ahead of Rashad Perriman. Yeah, Kevin White. Um, So, I mean, I think uh, my expectation is that he would garner something in the range of like that 8 million to like 10 million range, kind of like Robbie Anderson, probably a little less because Anderson's a little bit more proven. And I think he is totally worth that shot because, you know, we kind of covered this before, but in weeks 13 to 17, he was the wide receiver three overall. And from weeks 15 to 17, when both Evans and Godwin went down, he was a wide receiver two overall. So, Mike, not to not to cut you off or call you out, but I remember towards the end of the season you were like, "Man, all these people love Brashad Perriman. This yeah. guy sucks." And then he, dude, just, I was so wrong. Exploded. I was too. I'm like, this guy has no hands. His hairline is terrible. He's gonna be terrible out there. <laughs> and he was he was eating. He was he was dominant. He was the number one wide receiver on that team, and he was playing as such. Yeah, dude, I was so wrong about Brashad Perriman, and that's the, that's the good thing about fantasy, man. Like when you're wrong, you got to take it. And then, you know, make adjustments. And ma- I made a ton of adjustments. <laughs> he, became, <laughs> he became my top uh, buy candidate. I've been buying him up everywhere for like thirds and fourths. I think those are too cheap now. Uh, but I'm still on the buy train because people have forgotten about him given all the combine and all these incoming rookies and stuff. But honestly, I can't really name more than like maybe six or seven wide receivers that I'd rather have in this rookie class over Brashad Perriman because I've seen him kind of do it in – the NFL already he's an elite athlete right he runs like a 4-4 and he's got that prototypical size he ran a 4-2 like 4-2-8 no 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 he ran a he ran, I think he ran a 4-3 let me check here he definitely didn't it. run a he didn't run a 4-4-2 he ran like a 4-3 4-3 holy shit okay he ran a 4-3 flat <laughs> so he is incredibly fast so you know he's got that deep burner speed uh he's got the burst um we already said this but his comp is kevin white but he's actually been more productive in kevin white in three games than kevin white has been his entire career so he's got the first round draft capital so i think you know from a mental perspective like nfl teams like okay like this guy is proving and showing the things of why he was invested in first round like the other teams did so he's been productive although given it's a small sample i understand that but that's still a bigger sample than a lot of the rookies will have right uh, in terms of landing, I've been saying this forever, but I think like Philly should be going after this guy because Amari Cooper is going to cost you a boatload of money, right? And I don't know if they can afford that. They have about $41 million in cap space, um, but they can afford like an 8 to $10 million guy in Brashad Perriman, and he's going to take that alpha role, and then they also should draft someone. Like if they draft a Henry Ruggs or a Jalen Rager, uh, a real field stretcher, and a uh, opposite Rashad Perriman I think that's a pretty lethal combo for Carson Wentz to have right and we saw how good he looked in the first couple of weeks with Deshaun Jackson there Deshaun Jackson was like elite when he first got there yeah. this past season before he hurt his hamstring like Carson Wentz has that arm he's shown that deep accuracy if he can get a guy like Rashad Perriman or even that duo that you mentioned I mean stonks are up for Carson Wentz as long Dude, as he can stay healthy love Carson Wentz this week this year if he gets that um, in terms of vacant opportunities, okay, 70 targets are gone if, if Brashad Perriman leaves. But we have to remember that Jameis threw the ball for 626 times this year. 
I mean, I guess that's that's really what you need to get 30 plus interceptions. But Jameis got there. I mean, Jameis, dude, we love you, man. You're a fucking national treasure and never changed, dude. One of the most entertaining players in the NFL, for sure. Yeah, I love uh, tracking his offseason developments. They're like they're basically rebuilding him. They give him LASIK, they give him like yeah. a new shoulder. He's gonna come back next year, he's not gonna look anything the same. He's gonna lose like 50 pounds and he's still gonna throw like 35 picks. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think like there's vacated targets, but I think that overall target volume is going to come down. Whoever else is there, and so you know you could say that maybe it's good for Justin Watson, maybe it's good for Scotty Miller. I prefer Justin Watson of the two. He's got a better analytics profile, even though he went to a crappy school, uh, not a crappy academic school. He went to Penn, so he's probably pretty smart, but a crappy football school. Um, but that's not something I'd count on. You know, he's he's more of like those are more of like a deep end stash, and Godwin and Evans already have massive targets, so they're not going to really see much difference from um perriman leaving yeah and a bulk but of those it, targets came when those two were injured anyway so it's not like those are really his targets that he gave up they're more yeah. targets that he took from the other two and then now he's giving them back to them yeah exactly but if it's the for the new team if he does go to philly uh greg ward dude i love your story bro but you're, you're probably getting the boot and then uh nelson aguilar yeah. uh poor guy man now it's nelson aguilar football yeah, whatever that Lion King gif is where they throw the little baby off the cliff, that's basically what they're going to do to Nelson Aguilar for Sean Perriman plus Jalen Regulander. So I think that's like just literally it's the perfect fit. And like if I am freaking Brashad Perriman's agent, I am dialing Philly like nonstop. And honestly, if I'm Philly, you should be fucking dialing Brashad Perriman's agent nonstop because this guy is the perfect fit for you guys. Um, you can't just build a wide receiver core of rookies alone. You're going to need some vets in that in that locker room. I think he's the perfect guy for them. Um, in terms of buying, like I said, I've been buying him for multiple third rounders. I think he's probably going to cost you maybe an early third plus or, you know, a late second. But I'm fully willing to part ways with a second for Rashad Perriman if I'm a contending team. He's still only 26 years old, so not even in his prime yet. And, you know, he could be entering that prime as he goes. So, but I think the easiest way is probably still to acquire him via a package deal because people still view him as like a throwaway. You know what I mean? That's what I'm thinking. Like just have him as a throw-in. I was doing like in mock drafts, you can see like where he's going. That's obviously not exactly his ADP, but in one league, I think I drafted him in the 14th round of a 12, yeah. of a 12 man league. Like at that price, he's basically a throw into any deal. You want to do it before he gets signed to a new team because if he does land in Philly, it's going to probably oh cost God. you a, a mid second at least because people are going to you know, see the news. They're going to see a Schefter tweet. They're going to look at what he did last year and be like, oh, shit, this guy's legit. He's going to be with Deshaun Jackson, what we hoped he would be. Um, and the price is going to skyrocket similar to this price skyrocketing that we saw of Austin Eckler, except this guy's a wide receiver. It's obviously not going to shoot up as high, but like the hype is definitely going to build around him, especially when you remember what he did last year. So, yeah, if you're going to buy him, buy him now because that price can only go up. Yep. Now. Moving on to the aforementioned god, Jameis Squinston. This dude <laughs> was a fraud last year, and he's probably not going back to Tampa because I don't think Bruce Arians can handle any more of his shenanigans. Uh, as for where I think he could possibly go, I don't know. I don't know who wants to take on a guy who's going to throw 30 picks. Maybe the Chargers because they basically had Jameis Winston last year and Phillip Rivers, except Jameis Winston is a little bit more like humble. He's not going to scream like, Frick yeah, frick yeah. <laughs> he's not going to be like, if he's going to swear, he's going to swear. And he's not going to be like uh, also outgoing as Phil Rivers. He's probably going to play basically the same, you know, pepper the slot, pepper deep targets and not complete any of his passes. I'm used to it. I'm not mad about it. But other than that, I don't know where else he would go. As for what he Colts, by, baby. Colts? I don't know, dude. That's Frank Reich would like, I don't know what Frank Reich would do to him. He just had like, <laughs> Uh, Jacoby Brissett who couldn't throw more than five yards down the field now he's gonna have this dude that doesn't have any type of 2020 <laughs> vision just like throwing 70 yard bombs to Paris Campbell's broken hand <laughs> that, that that duo is not a match made in heaven as for what he leaves behind he does throw the ball deep 99 deep attempts this year was first in the league he completed 40 of them which was the best in the league but his adjusted deep completion percentage which is basically the passes he completed plus drops uh so basically accurate throws divided by attempts was 15 we all kind of know that he's not the most accurate player he's just gonna throw it deep he actually looked a little bit better when he had that falcon re-glove on towards the end of the season but, <laughs> oh yeah uh, <laughs> i forgot he broke his thumb too dude this guy is he's a legend <laughs> he's like the iron man whatever the iron giant whatever so as for what he would impact this year right people say he's a dgaf and if you don't know what that means look it up he's a dgaf quarterback who's just gonna throw the ball deep down the field he doesn't care Mike Evans benefits because he throws the ball all around the yard so much. 
First off, let's look at their coach, Bruce Arians. He's a DGAF offensive coordinator. He's a DGAF coach. You look at what he did in Arizona with his quarterbacks, their deep attempts and their ranks uh, during his time with the Cardinals, 74 deep attempts, seventh, 90 deep attempts, first, 86 deep attempts, third, 76, which was fifth, and 71 deep attempts, which was fifth. So he's top five all but one year. So if you think that Jameis Winston leaving is going to all of a sudden change the philosophy of this, of this team, you're wrong. I mean, they had Ryan Fitzpatrick go in there, and he was basically Jameis Winston 2.0. So to say that you think Mike Evans is going to suffer from a terrible quarterback leaving, I don't know. I don't see it. On top of that, looking at what Mike Evans did last year, right, he saw 1.9 deep targets a game, but only 0.7 deep receptions a game. So sure, he was throwing it to him a lot, but less than one deep What's catch a game. It's not a huge – I don't know what you said, but it had it probably had something to do with Jameis Winston being an idiot. So, it wasn't hitting him, dude. He was, he was throwing it to him, but it wasn't hitting. Basically, like, whatever. I, I can just go on and on about how bad Jameis Winston was. But, you know, a lot of his volume wasn't actually on deep targets or deep receptions. Uh, Chris Godwin, contrary to popular belief, had more deep receptions than Mike, Mike Evans last year. So to just say that he benefits solely from a guy that throws deep isn't correct. On top of that, I went through some digging on his touchdowns. Last year, five of his eight touchdowns came in the red zone. Four of eight came inside the 10. And only two touchdowns came from 20, more than 21 yards out. He had a 21-yard touchdown, so it wasn't a red zone touchdown, but it was basically there. The only year where over half of his touchdowns came outside the red zone weren't even with Jameis Winston. It came with Josh McClown, and I think it was Mike Lennon was there. So he basically had, like, two of the worst quarterbacks I've ever seen thrown on the ball. That's when he was basically creating all by himself in the deep game. So I don't think Jameis Winston is going to have a huge impact on his deep targets. Obviously, if they don't get – if they get a more conservative quarterback, it would be dumb to say that his deep targets wouldn't go down. Obviously, if they get a guy like Teddy Bridgewater, although Bruce Arians loves to throw the ball deep, I don't see Jameis uh, – I don't see him matching what Jameis did this past year. But on top of that, right, Mike Evans is just a good receiver. People say he's a compiler. Me personally, I like when fantasy assets compile stats. I like when guys put up numbers, and I like when they produce for me on the field. So I have no problem with that. Uh, he's used heavily in the red zone. He had 16 red zone targets in 13 games over a 16-game pace. That's 20 red zone targets, which would have ranked third this year. So he's basically giving you long plays, uh, not as much as you may think, but he's giving you chunk plays. He's giving you, you know, receptions in the red zone. He's a target monster. He is getting you over 1,000 yards every year like clockwork. He's a great receiver. If people are trying to sell him for a mid-second or a mid-first, I'm jumping all over that price. The common consensus is he's getting older and he's losing his quarterback, and Chris Godwin is on this offense now. Was Chris Godwin not on this team last year? Was Mike Evans not a top five receiver last year with Chris Godwin there with a quarterback that ended 30 drives short because he couldn't see his receivers? Like, you have to realize that just because Godwin is a good receiver doesn't mean Mike Evans can't be a good receiver. And we saw that last year. So, Mike, I'm not sure if you've seen any trades go down in your leagues with Mike Evans. Uh, I have him in one league that I took over an orphan. I'm trying to rebuild. I'm just not selling him because the price isn't there for me to sell him. It just doesn't make sense to give him up you know, a mid first and a third round pick. So I'm not sure if you've seen any, any sales of Mike Evans or any acquisitions of him, but if you have, let, let the audience know what's up, let them know the big facts. Yeah. I, I think that um, I'm totally on board with you. Like, I think like, let's not forget that Mike Evans is the only receiver in NFL history to kick off his career was six, 1000 yard seasons. Compiler. Like people, I don't like that compiler. Yeah. Like you can compile all the stats for me that you want, but let, let, let's give a sample for what some of the trades. Okay. Recently, based on the DLF train find, trade finder, Mike Evans for Christian Kirk plus Joey, Belt Joey Bosa. It's obviously IDP, IDP league. Look, I love Christian Kirk, but there's no way in God's green earth I'm giving up Mike Evans for Christian Kirk you and a hope, defensive player. You hope Chris, C Christian Kirk becomes half of what Mike Evans is. Yeah. Another one, Tyler Boyd plus DJ Shark. On surface, pretty damn fair. I like, the, I like Tyler Boyd. I like DJ Shark. If you're in a rebuild, I would I – would, you know, I could see taking that other side. But in any contending team, I'm sticking with Mike Evans. Yeah, I'd rather have one guy that gets me 15 points a week than two guys that give me, like, nine or ten. Like, And then you yeah. can fill that second, you know, obviously easy math, whatever. Move on. Yeah. Here's another one. Mike Evans for Tyler Boyd plus Marquise Brown. Give me Mike Evans all day yeah, I don't like that long. At all. Uh, Mike Evans for Matt Ryan in a super flex. What the fuck? I don't yeah, even know what to say to that. Noodle arm. Yeah, look, uh, yeah. And then this one is probably more fair. Mike Evans for the 1.02. That's kind of where I, where I start considering because then you can get like a land, land a top running back. You know what I mean? I personally, if I'm a contending team, 
that probably means I have enough running back depth. I'm not giving up a top eight dynasty wide receiver for a single rookie pick. That's just me. I understand if you want to do it, but that's not where I'm going to go with it. Yeah, but, uh, but I yeah, think those, overall, those you off- see people may not be selling him as low as I may have thought, but there are definitely deals that you can just throw out there to acquire Mike Evans, like the one with Marquise Brown and Tyler Boyd. If you can snag that, that is a huge win if you acquire Mike Evans in that deal. We both see him as a top fantasy option at the wide receiver position. And also, I forgot to mention this, I went on long enough, but just the splits for Mike Evans with and without Jameis Winston, he actually averages more points without Jameis Winston on the field. And it's a 22-game sample as opposed to 60, 68 with him. So it's a big enough sample to you know, to rely on. Uh, basically, all his numbers went down except for touchdowns. That could be due to longer drives because Jameis isn't throwing 30 interceptions when a different quarterback is out there. But even his receptions, his targets, his yards, they're not all too far off. So I wouldn't be too scared away from it. As for Chris Godwin, what happens to him? Same old, same old. He is playing that slot role. He's an easy target to hit. A big reason why I was super high on Godwin this year was because we looked at what Arians did with his big slot receivers, their ADOT. Uh, I, I think I looked at Larry Fitzgerald and I cross-referenced it with uh, Adam Humphreys the year prior, what he was doing in the slot and how high his catchable targets were from Jameis Winston compared to what Chris Godwin's were. And a big reason I was high on, high on Godwin is because a lot of his targets in 2018 weren't deemed catchable, whereas a lot of Adam Humphreys, who was playing the slot and had a similar dot to what Chris Godwin had this past year, were deemed catchable. So obviously the volume going to him would be actual volume rather than volume that didn't reach him. Um, so yeah, for whatever quarterback is there, he's gonna be an easy target to hit. Uh, he averages 6.7 yards after a catch per reception, which is huge, especially when he has a 10.4 a dot. So he does a lot of it on himself. And we touched on touchdown regression a few weeks ago and how, you know, you might not want to rely on wide receivers that score super long touchdowns only or five of his nine touchdowns came outside the red zone, I believe. But I went through and I looked at all of his touchdowns on YouTube. Somebody had like a cut up of it. Only one of them was on a throw of greater than 10 yards. Basically, they were all done by himself. So he's a receiver that can create for himself. He's not super reliant on deep targets and deep receptions, although he had more than Mike Evans. He's basically a super safe, like top five dynasty receiver in my eyes. And paired with a coach that wants to throw the ball, paired in an offense that for as long as I've known the the Buccaneers, they can support more than one receiver, whether it was Mike Evans and uh, Vincent Jackson or these two. Uh, He's going to be perfectly fine there, in my opinion. As for tight ends and running backs, I mean, Bruce Arians is basically the main reason tight ends haven't been used. I don't see that changing as long as he's there and as long as O.J. Howard keeps buttering up his fingers before he plays a game. And running backs, Bruce Arians does like to target the running back. In Arizona, his final two years, I believe it was 22% of the time, both times. It was top 10 one season, and then I think he ranked 11th another season. He just really hasn't had a pass-catching weapon. That guy, Darryl Ogumbawale, is a good pass catcher, but he's not out there enough for him to really raise that uh, target rate. So if they do get a guy like Melvin Gordon, uh, even a Kenyon Drake type, that could definitely increase the target share to the running back. So that could hurt Godwin, and it could hurt Evans a little bit in the volume department. But that has nothing really to do with Jameis Winston. It has to do with surrounding pieces that they could add to this offense. But overall, Jameis Winston, I don't see him, you know, causing Mike Evans to regress as he leaves. I don't see, you know, a huge hit to Chris Godwin, and I don't see the rest of the offense really having a big impact. Like, you have to realize, Jameis Winston is good in, real, in, good in fantasy. In real life, he's not good at all. He, he ended 30 drives short. And you might say, oh, they want to throw him a lot more when he, when he throws a pick six or whatever. That, like, takes out so much air. It takes so much air out of a team when you throw a pick six or you drive down the field and you go in the red zone and you just throw it to the nearest linebacker. Like, it doesn't <laughs> always help. There's, like, men, there's a mental side to football. And Jameis Winston, he's not physical for sure, and he's definitely not mental, so. Yeah, I, I think this offense could, you know, sustain next year as long as they don't have a guy like Teddy Bridgewater who isn't afraid to throw the ball. Yeah, and hopefully it's not Phillip Rivers either um, because Phillip Rivers is basically Jameis Winston without the deep ball strength. So Yeah, I, I put on our Slack channel, Jameis Winston – or Phillip Rivers is just Jameis Winston with consent. I don't know how that's <laughs> over in our crowd, but that's, that's my idea of it. Love that. <laughs> next up, Austin Hooper. Um, really exploded onto the scene and I know some people were high on him I wasn't too high on him I was way too low on him and he was a monster producer this year when he was healthy but he is an unrestricted free agent now and you know if I'm looking at what people are willing to pay him uh, I'd be expecting something in that like 10 plus million range because that's what Zach Ertz did Um, he has like a 12 million dollar a year contract if I recall correctly so that might be too pricey for the Falcons. And they've already said they're going to let him test the free agency market. 
And so I, I, I would be shocked, I think, if we did see him return to the Falcons because the Falcons only have, uh, what, $4 million in cap space? I think they're, they already literally, said they're not going to exercise yeah. any type of like uh, yeah. franchise tag or bring him back at all. Yeah, they can't. I mean, they're they're bottom three in cap space. They only have four point five million, so they're definitely not doing anything with with Austin Hooper. So, I see him. He's getting a lot of buzz in Green Bay Packers, and you know, people are like, "Oh my God, Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers, get help, guys." Pa- <laughs> Rodgers gives no fucks about tight ends. Just look at his historical stuff. Like he wants to target Adams, and now they're using Aaron Jones. Like Austin Hooper, get in line, dude. You're not getting many touchdowns or targets in the end zone. I think that's a very bad situation for Austin Hooper I honestly don't see any good landing spots that would boost his value or even hold his value I think Falcons were the by far the best given the volume that Matt Ryan was giving him and how bad that that team is in general so how much they passed completely but, subjective Mike not to cut you off do you think Austin Hooper is even good I think I think he's good look I think he's I good think. as a pass catcher because he's he, he, he was pretty efficient I don't think he's elite I don't think the numbers reflect his talent level I'll put it that way yeah, same for me. Like, if he lands in a different spot, as you were just saying, like, Atlanta is the best place for him to be. I don't think he has the talent to really supplant any situation and just, even if he goes to Green Bay, I don't think he's good enough to overtake Aaron Rodgers' tendencies and make him, yeah. make him a no. huge threat in the passing game. No, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers is a baby back bitch, and he's not going to change what he does. Like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, that's, that's just a proven thing in the NFL. Don't even, don't even fact check me on that. I know that's a fact. Um, <laughs> He, he's so, a bitch or you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Both. He's a baby back bitch. We know that. And you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> um, he, he leaves behind 97 targets. Okay, that's, And he only played 13 games. So that's 120 targets prorated. And in terms of the biggest benefactor, it's going to be Calvin Ridley. And we'll throw up the graphic on screen and I'll just read this out for you. These splits are mind-blowing uh, for anyone that uh, is looking to buy on Calvin Ridley without Austin Hooper in the lineup. And this is a little bit skewed too, because it doesn't have Sanu as well. So it's basically two pass catchers gone, but nevertheless, he scored 22 points per game in those three games without Austin Hooper Uh, averaged a hundred yards, 10 targets and two thirds of a touchdown and seven receptions. So you're looking at a wide receiver one without Austin Hooper. So, you know, Ridley is someone that, I didn't love coming into the draft and coming into the NFL because he's old and his analytics profile isn't good, but he produced in year one and he produced again in year two. And now we're in a situation where, you know, there's going to be a ton of vacated targets for him. So I think that Calvin Ridley is a huge buy right now. Now, what would you be willing to pay for, for Calvin Ridley? Obviously he's not going to score 22 points a game, right? But let's say he scores like, that, you know, without, with Austin Hooper, he scores in the 13 points, right? Let's say he even gets like a three to four, three to four point boost. He scores like 16 points PPR game per game. Like, what are you willing to pay for that? I would pay in a super flex league uh, in terms of rookie picks. I'd probably go 110 or later. I, I basically have like a big 10. I think it's like the top three quarterbacks, whatever the third quarterback ends up being based on draft capital, uh, the top four running backs and the top three receivers for me. If that adds up to 10. I, I'm pretty good at math, I guess. Uh, but after that, I could see Calvin Ridley. Like he's he was older as a prospect. He's still young in terms of fantasy production. He's still heading into his prime. And as we touched on earlier, like a lot of these receivers that you're going to end up drafting, whether it's Denzel Mims, who you might love, or Justin Jefferson, or whatnot, like these guys don't always produce year one or year two. You could just sell, you know, that 110 to pick up a Calvin Ridley, and then a few years down the line, buy a Denzel Mims, buy whatever for a cheaper price where you can acquire Calvin Ridley, who is a known commodity and is a known producer. And as you said, when Austin Hooper isn't on the field, he completely dominates and he eats and he kills the NFC South. Nick and I had talked about it this past season. Like his splits against the NFC South are ridiculous. He averages like over a touchdown a game. And I'm pretty sure he yeah. just gets injured when he doesn't have to play the NFC South. So his numbers can still look pristine. Yeah, dude, I totally agree. I would be willing to go a little bit higher. I'm actually willing to go into that 1.08 range. Um, especially if I'm a contender, just because rookie wide receivers just so rarely like produce. And if I can get a wide receiver, one who's still young on my team right now, like, and I'm a contender, I'm totally happy giving up that pick. And to be honest, like the community isn't, doesn't view him as like a true wide receiver one. Right. And you love getting those guys that aren't true wide receiver ones, but give you wide receiver fantasy production because the production will always exceed the value that you have to pay for them. He's like a slightly healthier Will Fuller. Like when he's on the field, you can just lock and load him into your lineup and you're getting at least wide receiver two numbers most of the time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
In terms of other benefactors, I see a lot of people, you know, it's kind of that like deep stash tight end sleeper season. Everyone's just throwing out names there, hoping it sticks. Look, uh, Jaden, what's his name? Like Jaden Graham or whatever. Look, yeah, this Jayden, guy. I was going to say Jaden Smith. That's like the no, only Jaden no. I know. No, Jaden Graham, uh, he's, you know, look, he's, he's not someone that I'm investing in, and I don't think he's the one that's going to benefit. Like, I'm really just targeting Calvin Ridley. Julio already gets like a million targets and never scores touchdowns anyway, so I'm, I'm not going to – it's not really at that boost of a – big of a boost to Julio. But Calvin Ridley, this is an incredible buy opportunity. You know, I've, you know I said to buy him on a couple other guest podcasts I've been on, and I'm telling you to buy him again now. Like, get this man. Like, when you're on the clock and you have one of those, like, mid to late first and you need a wide receiver – definitely click the buy button on uh, Calvin Ridley. Yeah, the Falcons the... might just bring back Tony Gonzalez, to be honest. I mean, that guy's <laughs> yeah, yeah. In terms of the new team, if he lands on Green Bay Packers, uh, I don't really think he impacts Devonta Adams for the reasons we said before. Like, Rodgers loves Adams. Rodgers loves throwing wide receivers in the end zone. Um, maybe Aaron Jones' stock takes a little bit of a hit on the target side because Austin Hooper is there to kind of soak up some targets down the middle. But honestly, like, between Rodgers and even with the new coaching, I just – I just don't really see it change. Like if it changes, like once it, once I see a trend of changing, then I'm willing to pay a little bit of premium for it, but I'm definitely not willing to pay market price for him to just get that like Rogers name value bump to passers to pass catchers. On top of that, it's not always bad to have like a good weapon go to another team, right? That more efficient, more red zone trips, possibly it could end up helping a guy like Aaron Jones. Obviously he scored a ton of touchdowns this past year, but if you were maybe expecting him to regress to 10 uh, just off of like pure conjecture, you might see him increase a little bit from that regression because the offense is down by the red zone a bit more because his, you know, Aaron Rodgers' number two receiver isn't Alan Lazard anymore. It's it's Austin Hooper. Yeah, for sure. And the other name that I've oh, sorry, the other team that I've seen thrown around is the Chicago Bears. Rest in peace. Uh, I mean, look, like what the Bears need is a fully complete blocking tight end, right? I'm not sure. Like, look, I don't watch Austin Hooper blocks. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, that's not something I like to spend my time on. So, if you're a film grinder and that's your, you know, you get excited. I know somebody who probably saw him. uh, Let me know. Let me (laughs) know. about him later. Yeah, let me know. Uh, But I think if he goes there, that's definitely a hit to Anthony Miller. Because, look, Mitch Trubisky can barely support a wide receiver one and a wide receiver two. So, I I know for a damn fact he's not going to support a wide receiver one two and a tight end so I think they're gonna eat into each other and they would definitely kill each other's value but also I just don't see that as too likely either because the Bears are bottom 10 in cap space they only have 16 million in cap space and their O-line is complete trash so I think it's probably more likely maybe they like draft a blocking tight end in the the draft and try and fill some of those holes in the O-line before committing a 10 million dollar contract to Austin Hooper but that's just that's just my thought I'm not excited about anybody in Chicago. We already fell for the Trey Burton trap a few years ago, and <laughs> he couldn't stay on the field. And even when he was, like, half the field is basically gone when Mitch Trubisky is a quarterback. It's like those old Madden games with, like, the vision cone. It's like his stops halfway at midfield, and, like, you can only look to the right. So if Austin Hooper's ever there on the left side of the field, basically half of his targets are gone. So, yeah, anybody in Chicago I'm not too high on other than Allen Robinson. In Green Bay, I mean, I'm sure he'd be more u- more used – used more heavily, there it is, than Jimmy Graham was. But still, even then, like, Atlanta's just where he should be. It's where he is best utilized. And if that's not the case, then I'm not going out to buy him and getting excited about new landing spots for him. Yeah. But also, if he goes to Green Bay Packers, Sternberger's dead. So, rest yeah, he's, he's kind of been dead. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what I'm willing to pay, look, if I, if I really need a tight end, I would, I would probably give a late first, but – if I'm not desperate, I'm really looking into that early second early second range for non-tight end premium leagues. And obviously, if it's tight end premium, then I'm willing to give up the first. But even then, I'm not trying to give like mid or top first where I can get running backs. Yeah, if I had him, I'd probably just sell him because you know whatever situation he lands in, like it's basically written in stone that he's not going back to Atlanta. Like whatever situation yeah. he's in, we brought it up a bunch. Like it's not going to be as good as Atlanta. And if somebody thinks it is or it's going to be close, just capitalize on that and maybe try to buy another tight end that's cheap like a Johnny Smith. Yeah, he's currently the going as a tight end seven still, so pretty rich. I mean, if you can get like a a young swap, like if you can get TJ Hawkinson, if you can get Noah Fant, right? Like one of these guys. He's more on top Hooper. of that too. I bet you can get like Hawkinson and maybe a second for that. I don't know about second, maybe a third, but it, it depends. It depends. Either way, you know, I, I would take it. 
Yeah, I would definitely take it. I would take it one to one. So go out there and explore some opportunities and sell them before the before the price correction comes. And you know, highly recommend that. But yeah, that's all we got for the deep dives. We're gonna go through some rapid fire now for some of these other big freighter names. And no, and I'll just give you our quick thoughts so we don't end up taking up your entire night. <laughs> but uh, first up, Marcus Mariota. God damn, what a sad story. <laughs> what a sad story for the for the man. You got got benched by comeback story. Ryan Tannehill, uh, his current ADP is undrafted, so nobody even wants to touch him. Well, obviously, we're only talking about him in terms of super flex leagues. Uh, where do you think? Where do you think he could potentially land, and what do you think some impacts would be? You know? Yeah, we talked about this prior. Uh, we think the Patriots could be a landing spot. I thought Oakland because I'm not sure if he's a Gruden grinder or not, but if he was, he might take a shot on him. I don't know, man. Marcus Mariota was so good in college, and even early in his career, he had so much promise. But like, he just—I don't think he has any confidence really. Like. Yeah. I was listening to a Titans podcast. It's like a barstool one, and it's pretty good. And they were just talking about Mariota, and they're like, he's such a nice dude, but like they don't know if he if he just has the juice anymore. Maybe Bill Belichick can instill that in him, and he just you know he takes what is seemed to be a washed up quarterback and turn him into what he was supposed to be. That'd be pretty cool. But I don't see him taking over a starting job anywhere. Maybe he's an intriguing guy that if the starter gets hurt, you throw him into your super flex and hopefully he doesn't get you negative points. He's not somebody I'm going out to acquire. He's not somebody that I'm selling because probably nobody is buying him. Yeah. I mean, I would have loved to see him go to the the Bucks, to be honest, like just a Jameis, a Jameis Mariota swap from that class. <laughs> a little um, what if. Yeah. Cause oh, I mean, look, suck. like Mariota, to be honest, like I was a fan of him and like he just he just never got a shot right like he went into an offense this like under center grind the clock out with Derrick Henry type offense with like one and single and only double wide receiver sets and that was like viewed as like sexy by them uh, for whatever reason like he needs to be in a spread offense because that's what he came from right he came from Oregon they run a spread offense you know talking three wide receiver sets like running down the field like I feel like the Bucks could have been like a great spot for him but like like you said man confidence injuries like this guy was never healthy so. Yeah, we're not gonna spend much time on him. Look, if he goes to the Patriots, cool. If he goes to the Bucks, cool. But you're only looking at him as a late round flyer in super flex leagues, and nothing, nothing more than that. Next up, old man Rivers, that old man Rivers. What do you think, man? Uh, your your hometown favorite. Yeah. Never used a condom in his entire life. Philip Rivers. What, what do you about? What do you think about him? Uh, you lied twice. First off, hometown. I'm not from San Diego. Number two, <laughs> I hate him, so he's not a hometown or a hometown favorite. Uh, I think he's going to the Colts reunite with Frank Reich. Honestly, I don't – what is there to say? Like, what's he going to do? People say, oh, yeah, he's going to boost his tight end. You do realize Philip Rivers has played with Hunter Henry, and he's played with Antonio Gates. Oh, he's going to boost the running back. He's played with Danny Woodhead. He's played with Austin Eckler. He's played with Melvin Gordon. You have to put some of the blame on him having really good options. Like, Naheem Hines isn't going to explode. Baby Hands Doyle, if they bring him back, isn't going to explode. Mo Ali Cox has a better chance of grabbing 15 rebounds than he does of catching five touchdowns this year. Like, Phil Rivers is dead in the water. I don't, man, it hurts me to say this, but like, I really don't care about Rivers. Like this, if he goes to the Colts, I'm just, I don't have to say anything. Like you're not buying him in dynasty. If you have him in dynasty, I don't know what you're doing for redraft purposes. Like just stay, stay far, far, far away from Philip Rivers. I have no interest in this situation at all. I totally agree. And, you know, I think the only, the only thing of note is I would say like T.Y. Hilton stonks is going to be, down if Philip Rivers goes there because that man cannot pass a deep ball to save his life. Do they still track like interceptions that were thrown to wide receivers? Because T. Y. Hilton might have like fifteen next year. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's gonna be it's, it's gonna, gonna be ugly. crazy. Everyone loves Paris Campbell. Look, I wasn't a fan of him coming in, and you know the the narrative is gonna be that like, hey, he he's really works really well in that short area of the field, and you know Philip Rivers made Keenan Allen. Philip Rivers made Austin Eckler. I'm on your board. Like I think Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen made him and not the exact reverse. So, and I'm not a big fan of Paris Campbell. So I, I don't think this creates any good opportunities to buy. If anything, if people in your league believe that Phillip Rivers is going to boost Paris Campbell, I would try and recoup whatever cost you can from him late second, mid second, like guys that fall flat on their face in their first, in the first year, like it's very hard to recover. Um, so yeah, he was injured a ton, so you could like write off some of that, but like even with Phil Rivers, like how good could Paris Campbell really be? I know I'm gonna yeah. look like an asshole when he catches like 85 balls <laughs> and like 100 yards next year, but like I don't know if, if there was a year to break out, it's not the year that Phil Rivers enters your offense. Yeah, yeah. Next up, big name Ryan Tannehill, one of the 
British comeback stories. It's not really comeback because he didn't get injured, but, you know, he was totally washed up and written for dead and, you know, came in and led the Titans to multiple upsets, including over my, my Patriots, sad to see. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, Tom Brady potentially going there because him and Vrabel are homies and people are creeping, creeping him while he's at the game watching his FaceTime, which, by the way, like, don't do that, man. That's fucking creepy yeah. as hell. Like, videos like that are, like, people taking pictures of people at the gym, like, chill yeah, out, like, man. It's like, dude, come on now. Yeah, come on, guys. Uh, but, you know, we think he's going to go back to Titans. Like, I think he fits that offense really well. He provides some rushing upside, you know, and, you know, the play action. And as much as people don't want to admit it and want to think that Derrick Henry is the only reason why that offense is any good, like, Tannehill was very efficient, both from, like, an EPA perspective, um, which is expected points added, as well as just deep ball efficiency, play action, um, passer rating. Like, he was top of the league in all those things when he was a starter. So I would love to see him go back to Titans. My recently started Debbie League would love to see him go back to Titans because I drafted him in the sixth round. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd love to see him in the Titans. Like, to say that he wasn't good in Miami, I mean, you kind of have to write that off, right? I mean, Adam Gates was there. He made everybody look terrible. So, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Ryan Tannehill. He definitely has that rushing ability. We didn't see all too much this year, but who knows? Maybe he unlocks that part of his game on top of the extreme efficiency he had last year. He's a pretty good stable of young talent, whether it be uh, A.J. Brown, whether it be John Wu Smith. They're probably going to add people through the draft. I don't know what picks they have. Maybe Corey Davis, actually knowing who his yeah. quarterback is going to be heading into the year, will help him a little bit. I yeah. like Ryan Tannehill. I, we saw, obviously, this year he was like a top five quarterback when he was actually yeah. starting. I don't think he wasn't even bad. In Miami, right? Like he, I yeah, looked. He I looked his at his stats. Was actually pretty high. Yeah, he had he had three seasons of around four thousand yards throwing, like twenty plus touchdowns, like call it twelve to seventeen interceptions. Like he wasn't elite, but he was a starting caliber quarterback, right? So in the super flex league, that's kind of what you want. Um, so I'm interested in Tannehill. I'm kind of buying. Um, I'm I'm holding him in leagues. I have him, and I'm kind of sending out some notes to see like if I can get him for a discount based on all these Tom Brady rumors. Who would you rather have, Ryan Tannehill or Jimmy Garoppolo in fantasy? Ryan Tannehill That's because, because of the rushing upside that, that he offers. Yeah, Jimmy G is signed for a long time, but if Tannehill gets a deal, he's probably going to be signed for an even longer time than Jimmy G is signed yeah, for. Yeah, for sure. Next up, Teddy Bridgewater. Not going to spend too much time on this. Everyone loves Teddy Bridgewater. We think he's a backup. Um, hate us if you want, but that's just what I think. Like, I don't think he's a starting. I, I get it. Like, he got the Saints a bunch of wins, but the Saints have the top ranked uh, offensive line. They have Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas. Like, on top of that, too, for in. fantasy purposes, like, how often were you excited about starting Teddy Bridgewater in a perfect situation with two top five guys at their position? Like, he's not giving you a ton of value fantasy wise. He's not a mobile quarterback. Like, he's not going to push the ball down the field. He's really nothing. He's like the Jake Fromm. Like, you might not think of him as Jake Fromm, but he is basically like Jake Fromm in, in sheep's clothing, if that's a setting. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not high on Teddy Bridgewater. Even if he does claim a starting job, like, eh, what do you want out? He's going to be like QB 25. Like, I'm not, I'm yeah. not into that. Like, is the situation going to get better than the Saints? I would not. venture not. Uh, next up, the GOAT, Tom Brady. It fucking pains me, man, that he's not going to retire in a Patriots uniform, but it looks like that's – the path we're headed down i mean the greats also didn't i mean joe montana also got also went somewhere else but man like brady is one that should have definitely retired in the patriots uniform uh looks like rumblings have him either going to like the titans because he's bff was very bull apparently or going to the raiders um if he goes to the raiders i think that's a negative for Julian Edelman. I'm not sure what that means for Harry because, you know, Brady obviously hates rookie quarterbacks, so maybe someone that lands there is more willing to give Harry a chance. And new team, I mean, that's stock up for Waller, right? People are, like, really off of Waller for some reason. Like, he's 27, which isn't that old. He doesn't have any tread on his tires. He just signed a new deal. The dude had, like, what was it, like 80 catches, 90 catches, yeah. 1,000 yards. Like, he was awesome last year, and people are just selling him. Like, what leads he's an elite to athlete. not going to be good? Elite athlete. I think people are worried. I'm slightly concerned about Hunter Renfro because the splits with Renfro aren't great and they do operate in that same part of the field. But, you know, it is small sample bias, right? Like there's only three games. So I'm not going to make any drastic decisions. I still think Waller is a buy. Um, I would rather have him than Hooper, for example. So if you can get Waller for Hooper, cop that buy button immediately. And, you know, people are scared of them adding like wide receiver weapons. Like, dude, we get it. There's going to be more wide receivers. But at the end of the day, like they're still going to throw it to Waller. People are worried about the more elite athlete Foster Moreau, which just isn't true. Waller's way more athletic than he is. And Foster Moreau, all he does is vulture touchdowns, which sucks for the tight end position. But if you're playing in tight end premium, he may more than makes up for it through the receptions. So, look, 
guys. Get, get Waller. Volume is okay. king in fantasy football. When you have a guy who, even if his production takes a 20% hit, 20% off of 90 is 18 receptions off, like 72. Like 72 receptions out of a, uh, out of a tight end is fantastic. It's like what Austin Hooper gave you this past year, and everybody thought he was an elite tight end. Yeah, exactly. So not much more to say there. Probably bad for the rookie wide receiver if Tom Brady goes there because if anything, Brady hates rookies. So be on the lookout for whoever lands there if Brady goes. Next up, big dog's favorite, <laughs> Derrick Henry. Dude, it's, it's, it's looking more and more like Titans are not going to resign him. The thing is, like, why wouldn't they have signed him or extended him or whatever up to this point? Like, he was such a big part of that offense despite running backs not mattering. Like, he, they wouldn't have made it as far as they did without him on the field. And 100%. you would have thought they would have shown how much he was worth by, you know, giving him some money. But they haven't done it up to this point. It doesn't look promising. Free agency, by the time this video is out, I believe it would have started already. Like, I don't know if they're going to shell out that much money for a running back who is he's not old. He's obviously aging a little bit. And other teams have money, and they're going to probably splash for him, especially teams like the Bills, who want to run the ball, have Devin Bingo. Singletary have a beautiful tandem out of that backfield like I don't know I don't think Tennessee is the move for him obviously for fantasy that's probably best case scenario the Bills obviously isn't also a bad situation but if he's gonna be splitting touches and behind a worse offensive line I don't know he's his stunks could be a little bit down yeah he's vacating 330 touches though so Deion Lewis, Lewis. bye bye Deion bye. Lewis baby bye 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 and obviously they're not gonna roll with Deion Lewis alone but you know, whatever rookie lands there, or maybe another free agent, maybe Kenyon Drake. I mean, what if who knows? Jonathan Taylor goes to the Titans? Dude, Jonathan Taylor goes to Titans. That's one of the top betting spots. He's my rookie 101 still. He'd be like a dynasty top six or seven running back for me. Top eight for sure. Uh, easy lock button on that one. Top, top O line. Uh, but if he goes to the Bills, man, Singletary stonks us down the fucking drain, man. All the Singletary workhorse dreamers, rest in peace. Uh, I I don't think Singletary is a workhorse no matter what, but if someone like Henry or Gordon lands there, man, uh, it's going to be bad for, for Singletary for sure. But like, it, it, may, it just makes so much sense, right? Like the AFC East is wide fucking open because Tom Brady is gone for the first time. The dominance of the Patriots in two decades is kind of, you know, in question. And last year they were so close, right? They were so close to making the playoffs somehow through the game against the 1.01 of throwing games and, Billy, Bob, OB, but they managed to do it. And they couldn't close it out because they had Frank freaking Gore in the backfield. Imagine if they had Derrick Henry, right? Someone like Henry. Someone like still in the league. There was one game last year where he ran into his offensive line three straight plays on the <laughs> one-yard line. It's like if – that's a perfect example. Like Devin Singletary just isn't going to be a goal line back because they gave it to Frank Gore so many times on the goal line, and he failed so many times. Like yep. if they had any confidence in him in that part of the field, he would have seen a few of those touches, and he just didn't. But to say yep. like Devin Singletary is useless – uh, I know you didn't say that. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but like I don't, I don't agree that if Derrick Henry goes there, he's going to die, right? He's he was used no, no. in a split workload this year, and he was still very efficient. He wasn't using the passing game as much as I would have liked to see. Uh, I believe he went to FAU or FIU. He was used FAU. For, FAU. He was used very heavily in the passing game there. So not to say I think he's an elite receiver, but he's definitely capable out of the backfield. He would basically be like a juiced up what Deion Lewis was in Tennessee. So he's yeah, not somebody yeah. I'm I'm trying to sell like rapid fire because we think 10 uh they're gonna add derrick henry this offseason but he's not also somebody i'm buying hoping he's gonna be a workhorse because that's just not yeah. His yeah if you're a contender look throw out that mid first see if you can get derrick henry done because wherever he lands you know he's probably gonna be a workhorse um so it's a good buy next up joho jordan howard um you know he got hurt this year but when he was with philly like he was doing he pretty good that. you know he, he wasn't good bad at all he yeah. basically killed Miles Sanders. Anybody's hopes of Miles Sanders breaking out, he destroyed them, and then his like shoulder sprained, and then Miles Sanders blew up. But yeah, Jordan Howard's an unrestricted free agent. He's surprisingly young. I think he's like 24 or 25. We yeah. have his landing spots as the Chargers or Packers, uh, basically playing third wheel in either situation. Just somebody that can you know run between the tackles, uh, in between the 20s or on the goal line if need be. So yeah. for a fantasy option. Eh, for real life, he could provide some decent value to a team, especially at the price tag he's going to command. It's not going to be too high. Yeah, dirt cheap, man. RB44. Like, again, I can't even name 43 running backs. So I would definitely be willing to buy at those types of prices. You know, what if he lands in the Bills and he becomes their goal line back? Like, what if he lands, you know, on Houston and takes over the Carlos Hyde role? Like, these are all still valuable fantasy options. So don't write Jordan Howard off. We know he's got brick hands. He can't catch, but. Look, at the end of the day, at those types of prices, like for that flex buy week fill-in, like, you know, he could be that option for you guys. Next up, Matt Breida, King Breida. Freaking love this dude. 
can't stay healthy though. He's a restricted free agent. Um, so, I mean, neither of us really understand how the tenders and all that stuff works for an undraft free agent. Like it's a freaking like black box, but yeah, we're like, not lawyers. We're just here to talk about fantasy. And when we see an R in front of an FA, we kind of just, we're like, yeah, he's probably going back to that team. Yeah. Because look, the, the 49ers, as much as I want them to get a running back because how good Shanahan is with running backs, all they have is a first round pick and they don't have very much cap space at all. They're like bottom, bottom five in cap space with that 12 million. So I think it just probably makes sense to like for them to hold the cheap running backs they have and just run a committee, right? With Breda, Mostert, McKinnon, if he ever gets off IR. Um, honestly, they should just cut him, but with Breda and Mostert. So I, I honestly think that Breda is just going to go back. Yeah, he's somebody else who I think you just add as a throw-in in a deal. People think he's like dead. He's still pretty young. When he was on the field last year, at least early on in the year, he was very efficient. He had a few pretty big games, so he's not somebody I ever expect to be a running back one or a running back two by season's end, but you can definitely throw him out there, and if we see his role, uh, see an uptick at any point in the season, he could be a decent fantasy option behind a really good uh, offensive line with a good offensive-minded head coach. Yep. Next up, A.J. Green getting the franchise tag treatment. You know, people are speculating it's a tag and trade. I mean, dude, I don't know what to say there. Like, I think that if you're a contender, uh, you could probably throw out, like, a late second and see if you can get them just because the chance of that late second giving you, like, even one top 24 season is probably lower than what A.J. Green can offer you. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, if he, if he stays the Bengals and he plays and he doesn't sit out another season, that's good. But, you know, he's a, it's a big question mark for AJ. I don't see him being, like, any worse than what Auden Tate was last year. And Auden Tate was decent. Uh, the offense would probably improve a little bit with AJ Green there. Like, he's a bit older, but he's not, like, 35, 36. He still had a few very good seasons. I believe he's had over 1,000 yards every year except maybe one when he got injured. But he's basically been productive every single year he's been on the field. It's going to help Joe Burrow if he has a legitimate outside weapon there. Tyler Boyd. I don't think it affects him too much. I mean, the last time AJ Green was healthy and Boyd was on the field, they were basically yep. producing – or Boyd was producing as much as he produced this year and when he was off the field in 2018. So, overall, it might help the offense efficiency-wise in real life. As for fantasy, as Mike said, I'm going to throw out a late second for AJ Green and hopefully he returns. I'm fine with it. If he sees any setback with his foot or his ankle or anything, like basically, you know, write him off as sad as that sounds. Yep. Next up, Manny Sanders, 30-plus-year-old wide receiver. You know, same he, thing with Brady, like, pretty much. Back, yeah, back to the 49ers thing. you go. Yeah, I mean, he got tilted today because someone reported that 49ers offered him $5 million and it was too little, and he got mad. Honestly, I think that's probably a fair price. But again, like, the wide receiver position, like, San Francisco only has one first-round pick, man. Like, I don't know if they're going to blow that on a wide receiver. So they could – I could very well see Manny Sanders going back. You know, they were – one quarter away from winning a Super Bowl, right? That could be pretty enticing for a veteran like Sanders. Yep. Um, a more interesting topic, Robbie Anderson, Spaghetti Anderson. He is reportedly seeking 10 million range, uh, 10 million per year, which, you know, is it seems like a lot. Um, you know, we think he could be a decent receiver, right? I mean, he's vacating about 100 targets, so that could be a slight uptick to Crowder, but I think more realistically, that's going to be an uptick to whatever rookie lands on the Jets. So whether it's Judy, Lamb, whoever they invest in. Um, we think that he could potentially go to Philly again because Philly is a great landing spot for anyone. Potentially stay with the Jets, not sure. Hopefully not because staying with Gase just makes me want to puke. Um, and then he could also go to the Raiders, right? You know, as Al Davis, uh, you know, famously loves speed receivers, that kind of mantra has basically stayed there. Yeah, if he goes to the Raiders, they basically have a clone of him in Tyrell Williams. And especially if Brady goes there, I'm not so sure how, that, how he would fare. I really wanted him to go to somewhere like Arizona last year when there was trade talks flying around. That didn't happen. They don't have a ton of money to pay him. Robbie Anderson, I think, is actually a very good real-life receiver. Obviously, in fantasy, he only produces like weeks 13 to 16, which is valuable. But uh, as for his landing spots, I don't like you know the Raiders and the Jets. We've seen them there. He hasn't been too good. Philly would be extremely interesting if they pay if they pair him and like a pairman or pair him in a rugs. That could be a very dynamic offense. So. He's somebody I'd buy because I don't think his price is all too high. He's wide receiver 44 right now. And basically, you know, for 25% of the season, he's going to double that output, be like a top 20 wide receiver anyway. So might as well just not have him as a throw-in because he's a little bit higher price than a throw-in, but add him to the deal and like flip a third in return for him in that deal. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would be willing to pay a mid-second for him as well if you're just looking at rookie picks and you need that extra wide receiver flex position. And next up, a couple of tight ends here. We're going to start off with Eric Ebron. 
And he's kind of forgotten. I mean, I haven't seen his name mentioned at all. And, you know, he got hurt this year, as he always does. And obviously with Jacoby Brissett leading the offense, you know, I mean, he was, the, you know, he was going to regress. Everybody knew it. And especially once Luck left, I mean, that was pretty much the, the end for him. Uh, if he leaves, probably good news for baby hands Doyle, who was also a free agent, but they'll probably just bring him back because he's, he's probably more conducive to what they need at that position. Uh, if he goes to a new team, like, where do you think we're going? We wrote down Dallas. If he goes to Dallas, that would be very, very interesting. Uh, Jason Witten quietly saw 83 targets last year and turned those into 63 receptions. If Eric Ebron is there, I don't see how he's not used at least as much as Jason Witten was used. And Eric Ebron, sure, he drops a lot of passes, but he's also very valuable in the red zone. Uh, he's fairly athletic for his size. I think he could be a very good fit, a big target for Dak Prescott. Basically what everybody thought Rico Gafford, I think that's what his, or Rico Gathers, what they yeah. thought he was like two years ago. So yeah, he's somebody I'm pretty high on. He's extremely cheap. Wide or tight end 26 per ADP yeah. like that basically means he's not a tight end so I, I he's like a throw in for me and I'm 100% fine just buying in on him yeah if you're in a tight end premium league like in drafts I see him falling like way way too far so I'm definitely willing to cop the smash button on him he's not old either what is he like 26 yep yeah he's pretty young he joined yeah. the league very young from Miami as well so he's, a, he's an interesting target for sure and then the last guy we'll cover very briefly is Hunter Henry um, obviously last year missed most of the season with the ACL. I mean, this guy just like is a walking train wreck. I really hope that he finally puts out a, a healthy season and is able to maintain it. You know, we probably think that he's going to get franchise tagged by the chargers. Doesn't really make much sense to let him go. Uh, he's pretty integral part of that offense. Yeah. I think he's just going to stay. What we've seen in years past is probably the same thing. Like going into this year, I didn't understand how heavily involved Hunter Henry really was or how he got those targets, but He's just a very reliable, you know, inside the numbers tight end who can block. He's like a very good blocker. He's a very good receiver. He's going to be an integral part of the offense no matter who's behind center. Uh, his ADP right now is tight end eight. That's about fair. I mean, we saw him blow up in a few games early on, and people are moving him to, like, their dynasty tight end two or three. That's really his ceiling. I don't see it staying around there, especially if the injury bug uh, keeps up with him. But, you know, he's, he's one of the very few tight ends that when he's out there, you can just slot in and not have to worry about, uh, having to score a touchdown to return value because he's going to see he's going to see volume he's going to see yards and he's going to come away with a touchdown here or there all right little technical difficulties before we head into the world famous narrative section uh, segment of the episode we're going to do a little plug season the draft guide at bigdogsdraftguide.com we have i believe it is 50 uh, profiles done we're going to have the startup bible by nick we're going to have draft strategies videos that are exclusive to the draft guides such as mock drafts that are tight end premium, super flex, in-depth look at prospects, uh, analysis of them after the combine, after the draft, basically everything you need for your uh, drafts for the rookie season, for the dynasty season. Right now it's super cheap. I'm not too clued in on the monkey knife fight deal. You can check out one of Nick's videos. I believe it's $10 and you get a match on monkey knife fight and you can get both guides. It's a great deal. I 100% recommend it. There is no bias in that statement at all, but uh, it's it's a very informative and fun ride. You're going to learn about why we hate guys like Chase Claypool, why we love Jalen Rager and Denzel Mims. Mike, I'm not sure what you have to add. I probably covered everything beautifully in depth because I'm a wordsmith, but uh, what do you have to add to that little promo? No, not much, man. Look, the guide's going to be an excellent resource for you guys, and we're going to be updating our ranks. I believe by the time this video has released, you'll have seen our uh, new rookie rank. So if you have the guide, you'll have access to that. Um, and you know, you have access to all the jokes about Noah's headband and his bunk bed and just, Not you jokes, know, just everything facts. you want for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Big facts only. So yeah, definitely head over there and cop the guide guys. Yeah. On top of that, I also want to plug the Slack channel. I should have probably done this early in the episode. People are going to yell at me for waiting this long to do it, but it's very, very, it's booming right now. People are just in there talking about stuff that probably shouldn't be talked about in a Slack channel, but there's, there's a lot of. Uh, talk about rookies, uh, trade advice, roster feedback, just good, healthy conversations about Dynasty. There's no arguing. It's just, it's a place for if you want to, if you're a beginner in Dynasty, you can learn the ropes. If you are a veteran, you can talk shop with other guys like Mike, who have been in this uh, area of fantasy football for a long time. It's just a good time. I think we got like 275 members. We have, I think, nine leagues set up, and they're all 12 man leagues. So that's that's a pretty good number. It's completely free to enter. You can just talk trash with whoever you want, meet new friends, see people in the BDGE community. Just 
network, you know, a little fantasy football networking never hurt anybody. Uh, it, it's a good time. I'll put the Slack link in the description. Mike, I don't know if you have anything to say about the Slack, but I can tell yeah. by your activity, it's a pretty good time in there. Yeah, I mean, I'm on that Slack constantly. I just, you know, I love shooting the shit and talking football with people. So, if you know, you know, if you want to hit me up on the Slack, you know, shoot some questions, trade review, roster review, you know, draft advice. You know, me and Noah are, are in there, and our, our buddy Scott BDG is also in there as well, and he's always hosting mock drafts. So, if you want to do mock drafts on Sleeper, he'll be the go-to guy for that. One thing I do want to say, Noah and I have released a detailed rookie prospect series. What are the things that draw you to him as your 101? A lot of people may not expect him to be as big as he is. He is five foot nine, but his BMI came in at the 87th percentile. So he definitely has that workhorse size. The size is definitely there. The three down skill set that you bring up is certainly there. The way that he's used in the passing game isn't as a screen receiver. He isn't just thrown to in the flats and you want him to create after the catch. He's used as a true weapon running, you know, 20 yards down the field, making good catches. As per yards after contact per reception, he was elite. 4.17 yards after contact per reception, ranked 14. He's a very good receiver and he's very good with the ball in his hands. You said he's got a dank dead leg. If you've watched The Walking Dead, that guy Herschel, he couldn't even stand up. <laughs> one intended. He couldn't stand up to DeAndre Swift's dead leg. And on top of that, his rushing numbers, his in-depth like broken tackles and yards after contact on the ground wasn't necessarily elite. The only issue I have with that is yards after contact. The word is contact. When you're DeAndre Swift, you don't get touched very often, right? It's a good offensive line. And on top of that, when you're just juking guys out of their shoes and they're just retiring on the spot, you're not getting touched. So if you have an 80 yard run where you go untouched because of the offensive line, but also because of your ability in the open field, that doesn't help those numbers at all, but that's not a reason to write him off. That's not a reason to not be a fan of him because he's been productive for so long. You don't make it to Georgia and you don't have three years of elite production without being good running backs. So there are really no holes in his game for me personally. Overall, he seems to be a no miss prospect. We all know, you know, it's speed score, it's draft capital, it's landing spot, it's college production, and DeAndre Swift really has it all. He was a big winner, I think, from the combine. Him running a 4-4-8 is, it's huge for him. He's not a Kareem Hunt where he waits for guys to hit him and then breaks like five tackles. I think he's, he's probably Eno more like, running into tackles. Yeah, not Eno Benjamin looking for contact or running into tackles. He's more like uh, that Dalvin Cook mold, right? Where he'll like juke you in the open field. He'll basically set you up one way and go the other way, and he cuts really fast. I mean, the cop is Matt Forte, but I mean, I think he's much closer to Dalvin Cook than he is to like Zeke, personally. Yeah. To me, he's a little bit of like a D'Angelo Williams. Yeah. Somebody can be used in both assets of the game and be very good in both and bring fantasy value. Those Every name we just brought up is has been a very good fantasy asset. He's somebody who can walk into the league and catch 60 balls as a rookie. Those videos are only available on the Slack channel because we didn't want to flood the YouTube channel with a bunch of videos. But, you know, they're about 10 to 12 minutes of all the information you could ever want about DeAndre Swift. You know, Jonathan Taylor has released this week. We got all the big names. Cam Akers, Cam Akers Robbins. came out yesterday, if you guys are watching this on Wednesday. Exactly. And, dude, I'm telling you, like, these are – I think I, I really like the how those videos turned out. We're overlaying, you know, film cut-ups. Noah's doing a great job of syncing, like, what we're talking about with what we see in the film. Thank you. We're giving you the big data. We're giving you the analytics. And we're giving you the big facts, man. That's all we do here at Big Dogs. We give you the big fucking facts because you need the big facts to win, and we want you to win your league. So head on to the Slack channel. Join a league. Shoot the shit. Make fun of our takes. Whatever you want to do. Watch the videos. A lot of resources for you guys over there. So make sure you check it out. And along with the big facts, we got a pretty big narrative this week. Mike, why don't, you, why don't you tell us what we're going to be talking about? This week's narrative is just because you played football makes you a better fantasy analyst. I know what I think about this, and you know this comes from some of the back and forth we've seen on Twitter. What do you think? I, I know I don't know if you played any D one ball, but I know you have some experience in flag football. So why don't you throw it out? Yeah, there. I played D one ball. I played D one intramural basketball. So I think I'm pretty qualified <laughs> to talk about fantasy football. I actually used to play flag football when I was like in seventh grade, and I used to <laughs> dominate because I was just bigger <laughs> than everybody else. But you know, I think I think those few years I was wearing a flag around my waist really taught me about the game. It gave me a good understanding of rookie prospects. Now when I watch film, probably I'd estimate about 88.8% more than anybody else. Uh, I think it gives me a really good understanding of football, just the nuance of the game. Like when you're running an out route, how many steps you're taking. When you're running a comeback, like how crisp those routes are. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a film grinder. I'm not afraid to admit it. And I think those few years of playing some you know, seventh grade flag football with a miniature football and no contact really give me a good insight in the game, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, look, I played uh, I played cornerback uh, for a Canadian high school football team, so you know I'm fucking qualified to grind the film. Uh, I can read the coverages. I can I can pick up the blitzes. Um, but look, all jokes aside, look, I I've total I have nothing but respect for guys that played played ball because they're definitely going to provide perspective that we don't see. But I don't think that necessarily makes them a better analyst. Um, a fantasy football player. Because- I just want to say something. If you think like my spiel was about like me talking trash with people <laughs> that actually played football, uh, I hope it didn't come off that way. There was a guy on Twitter this week that was just talking about how much football he's watching and playing that makes him better. I, as you said, I have complete respect for anybody who's played the game at a high level. It's just, it, you know, Twitter was kind of going wild this past week and we had to add, add our two cents about it. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, I, I just think that like fantasy – is is a little bit you know separated from real world football obviously good football players typically produce in fantasy but i think the real edges in fantasy come from like analyzing the numbers and understanding like you know the key stats that matter and which ones are sticky and the predictive nature so like film grinding has a definitely has a place in fantasy and i'm not an expert at it and i definitely rely on guys that are experts at it but like i think the argument of like hey like Look, I I played, you know, D3 football and rode the bench for three years or whatever, and I watch more film than you is like, you know, like, dude, get over yourself, man. Like, yeah, I think the overall takeaway is like everybody on Twitter just thinks that they're right about everything. And if we yeah. were right about everything, we'd be getting paid a lot more money than we're being paid right now. So. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. If I was, if I was always right about everything, uh, I would not be doing this show with Noah, man. I'd be Damn, are you probably playing, thing, I'd probably right? be I'd probably be playing DFS and just making money. That's what I'd be doing if I was right about everything. Yeah. If I was right about everything, I'd probably be up in the booth of Booger. That would be like such a good time. Just like yeah. school him while I'm up there with him. But yeah, overall, just if you're on Twitter and you're just like engaging in conversation, no need to be hostile. No need to call people frauds because they didn't catch two interceptions through three years in college. Like it's it's all right to not never play the game and give takes based on analysis like i'm not a professional mathematician and i can still tell you what like six divided by eight is like what is I it i don't know <laughs> that's what it is 75 <laughs> percent fraudulent yeah so look, look guys we we think we've said this before we'll say it again analytics matters film matters like i think you just got to take everything in stride and have the whole picture and i hope that you know we provided that balance you know noah loves grinding the tape i like to watch it occasionally you know i love grinding the numbers and you know we try to provide you guys that holistic picture and that and that balance um and look if you want to engage us on twitter hit us up man like we're always there uh, i will say like if you engage us on twitter like read the tweets man i think that that's like my number one pet peeve is like people don't even read the tweet and they just say something I'm like yeah. dude just just read man just read for me personally most of my shit right now is memes so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not much yeah. to take away from it yeah all right guys hope you guys enjoyed the episode uh we'll be back next week make sure you cop the draft guide make sure you join up the slack and uh we'll see you on twitter man.